SpecFicMedia.com presents Tintin Forever with hosts P.G. Holyfield and Valerie Durham. Everybody and welcome to Tin Tin Forever. Uh, I am PG Holyfield, and this is episode one, where Valerie and I will be talking about Tin Tin in the land of the Soviets. Valerie, how are you doing today? I'm doing fabulously, although I have to say I'm a little tired. I had four little boys over last night for a pre-Halloween sleepover, and it was. Uh, literally crazy all night long, screaming, playing video games, watching movies. <laughs> they never went to sleep. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to this because I need a little sanity time after all of that. Did you make them watch Tintin, the, the movie? I did not. That probably would have been a smarter move. You might have put Iron them Man three you, or something. You might have put them to sleep. Oh, That's true. No. but I'm bummed. No. But if they've been reading all night, then they would have been quiet and absorbed. That's, in that's all true. of the, the books and that's the albums. True. You could have sat back there and say, that's where they went wrong. That's where they changed things. No, <sighs> you know, there are many positive Alas. things. I think I like the movie more than you did, actually, uh, um, oh, based really? on your your thumbs down Previous. and tongue sticking out oh, at, this, at oh, the dear. camera. I'll try to pull it back. I'll try no, to pull it okay. back. <laughs> it, it definitely have, it has some issues, but uh, we'll get to that at some some future occasion where we can do a special yeah. show on that. Uh, for those that uh, watched Tintin Episode Zero, where we talked about ourselves uh, and about a little bit about Hergé and uh, the adventures of Tintin, uh, welcome back. Um, turned out to be a, a long editing process and uh, some of the audio wasn't uh, perfect. I uh, had some issues with with a little wire rubbing up against a, a, a microphone. So hopefully we Pesky won't have wires. that. Yeah. So hopefully we won't have that um, for this There's time. There's actually but. another, uh, PG, just to interrupt really quickly, there is another like snapping sound coming from somewhere that I can hear. That's actually going to have to be there. That's going to be on the, okay. the audio for the YouTube because I've got... Okay. I've actually got my little microphone going behind my head here, and it's rubbing up. Okay. I think it's rubbing against my hair, but that'll be just for this okay. backup thing. But I've also okay. got my got uh, just wanted my to audio. That yeah. We... Well, I, I okay. Guess. Thank you. Um. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, Hergé's first uh, foray into the um, extended serialized. Uh, version of Tintin called Tintin in the Land of the Soviets. Um, I have my copy. You have your copy. You can show yours this time. Do you have your copy? I do. I do right here. So there goes my face. Out. It's leaving. <laughs> my face now but, is being um, overcome by Tintin. <laughs> ooh, uh, um, it is. Don't you wish you had one? <laughs> yes, and we can we can tell you honestly, um, even if you are a fan of Tintin, this is definitely not his best work. We don't, I don't think that we would recommend you go out and buy it unless you right. are become a real fan of the later works and you want to see how it all began, I how agree. his artistic uh, talent was represented when he was only 22, 23 years old. Mm -hmm. um, see how you know. See what. You know what the beginnings look like as far as some of the um, things that show up later on, as far as his uh, just you know some of the running gags and the style yeah. that that he sort of starts here, and then you could also see which we'll talk about things that never really appear again in later ones because it yep. was his first time doing this, and he was uh, by his own account and uh, you know. Um, uh, admittance that he pretty much was doing this on, you know, flying by the seat of his pants. Um, uh, one of the quotes he had was that, um, you know, he would wake up on Wednesday morning and he, he would need to have, or it would be, you know, the newspaper would be printed Wednesday evenings for this Thursday newspaper that, that he was doing this for. 
and he would not have any idea what he was going to do to get Tintin out of the situation he had left him in. So, um, you know, you can tell that in a lot of, a lot of cases where, um, where either he, um, just spent, you can tell, uh, it's broken up into basically every two pages is a, a issue, I guess. Um, so you can see like there are some where he spends all of the panels of those two pages. D- very little happens cause he probably didn't have a full, fully formed idea of what he wanted to do. So he's like, okay, well, let me just draw, you know, these panels in the, in the jail cell and until I figure out how to get him out of the situation or, you know, he might have a, a traveling thing. So it's, you know, very, um, you know, two pa- two panel or two pages full of panels will be a complete, uh, you know, trip to a new place, and and so it's very, you know, the the flow of time and things as he was going through this, you can tell that he was he a lot there's of. A, there's a great example of that on page you know forty two through forty three where he's uh, there's a whole running gag through all these very large panels where all Tintin's doing there's a bad guy trying to break down a door, and Tintin, you know, at the last minute, opens the door, so the guy runs straight through, and then at the very end, the very last panel on that page, Tintin is all of a sudden dressed as a ghost. I mean, it's like, kind of, so, you can just see, Hergé was like, what do I do, what do I do, I got through this whole thing, I need one more panel, oh, the sheet falls over his head, now he's a ghost, and then the whole next section is, you know, maybe that was around Halloween time, maybe the publication was around that or something. Um, Yeah, and there's definitely (laughs) times where, there's definitely times where he went back to previously used joke uh, to... Uh, and I don't think it was a, as as a lot of comedy is. It's callbacks to something. I think it was just I have no idea what to do. Let me. Yeah. Uh, I use this thing. I yeah. or previously I put him in a or I faked being in this uniform. Let me stuff it full of pillows and make the guards think that I'm I'm dead over here. Let me do the same thing with this yeah. diving uniform. You know, set it up so it looks like a person. So they'll come right. and and think it's as use it as a decoy. So. Well, I think it's hard for us, too, as readers, because we're reading this kind of, you know, you can get through this book because the panels in this one are so much larger than in subsequent albums. Um, You kind of rip through it really fast, and there is kind of a a quick pace. Um, And I think what we have to realize is that other people were reading these once a week. And so where we're seeing some of these gags within a few minutes from each other, you know, original readers would have seen this over several weeks and may not have the same kind of recall or like, this just happened. You know, it would have been 10 weeks or something, whereas for us it's 10 pages, you know, uh, going back. So I think that does make it feel a little bit different. And I think like UPG, I was definitely uh, struck as a um, Tintin-ophile how much there were... um, little allusions to aspects and characteristics, not only of Tintin, but of other characters that I saw popping up that for me were kind of delightful, like seeing the origins of that. In fact, um, right in the very beginning of the book on pages uh, four and five, right when the panels start, uh, there's a kind of a bad guy in uh, on the train with Tintin on as he's on his way to Moscow, and the the guy really reminds me of Captain Haddock, and um, mm-hmm. now of course he's a total bad guy and he he lights a fuse on a bomb and blows up the whole train. So not that I don't think Captain Haddock isn't capable of that, and we'll discuss his character more in future episodes. But it you know it was interesting to see kind of that. Uh, uh, character kind of design was already in um, Hergé's mindset, and then you see it kind of reworked in a much more sophisticated way when Haddock shows up um, many albums later. Right. And before we get too deep into the story and specifics mm-hmm. of, of some of the panels and different things, let's go back a little bit and talk about uh, what was going on at this time and how uh, he actually got into doing this particular uh, album. Um, again, uh, Tintin in the Land of Soviets, it's the first comic album that he did for Tintin. Uh, it was in the Belgian newspaper La Vingtième Cycle. Is that, is that how to pronounce it? Well, and did I get it right? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Um, and it appeared in that, again, like we said, Thursday, the, they had a children's cereal or children's section they did every Thursday. And uh, he did this serialized in that every Thursday from January 1929 to uh, May of 1930. Uh, the story tells of young Belgium reporter Tin Tin and his dog Snowy or Milieu as it would be the Milieu. Mm -hmm. Milieu, um, who are sent by the newspaper to go to the Soviet Union to report on uh, the policies of the Bolshevik government. Um, dastardly Bolsheviks. <laughs> the dastardly Bolsheviks. Uh, the intention is to expose the regime's uh, secrets and lies. And um, because of this, the uh, government... Um, Sort of on the fly, once they just figure out, oh, this is an a reporter from, from Europe, we need to, uh, to kill him and make it look like an accident. Because I guess that's what they did to all reporters uh, <laughs> through, <laughs> throughout history. Um, Only and, the ones uh, that can't they, be fooled. Only the ones that can't be fooled by their propaganda. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> and um, yes, the, the secret police is called the OGPU. Um, they, they, throughout, they have different agents that are out true to, uh, trying to kill him. Um, it was the, the comic album was a commercial success. Um, it was turned into a book immediately after finished publication. Um, but, uh, after a while, uh, Herge, Herge, um, sort of came to see this as his, as I think he referred to it as the sins of my youth, as far as. Um, the main reasons being that, uh, was, he wasn't as well researched as far as, or compared to much of his later work. Um, you know, it was very one-sided. It was a piece of propaganda for this Catholic newspaper. Um, they, they wanted something that would be anti-communist and it, uh, definitely was, did present just what one side of this, uh, of the country, um, well, it was interesting that he actually picked up on this book by Joseph Duyer uh, called Moscow Unveiled. And it seems that, the, and this was this guy's account, he had been there for nine years in revolutionary Russia, kind of post-revolutionary Russia, and had kind of come out with this book saying, here are the kind of horrible things going on um, in Russia. And I, apparently Hergé kind of admits to just kind of wholesaling, wholesalely taking scenes and descriptions and kind of using that as his basis. So there are scenes where um, factories are being presented to British reporters, gullible British reporters, um, that the factories are at full capacity and look at all the smoke coming out of the chimneys and the clanging sounds. And then of course, Tintin, the diligent reporter that you can really believe goes behind the scenes and sees that they're just stuffing the smoke stacks with um, hay to create the, and then clanging, you know, corrugated boards, um, to corrugated metal to make it sound like things are really happening. So um, really, really technologically advanced. <laughs> Methods of trying on. to fool people, yes. <laughs> but I, um, I think that 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 was uh, something that Hergé later, you know, he really admits to trying to change. That he was not quite so one one sided about um, about what was going on there. Not that there weren't problems going on. Isadora Duncan, who I know very well, also went to Russia during this time period, and she became very disenchanted as well. So there were problems going on. But when you read this, it really does come across as very propagandized um, and not kind of just an even keel look, a, a neutral look, but uh, or an objective look. It really, you can tell that they're, they have an agenda here <laughs> regarding communism right. and the threat. You know, they perceive the, this new Soviet Union as a threat. So there's a little bit of an interesting thing here of, of that Hergé is doing with life imitating art where here he is an illustrator being asked to expose the evils of the new soviet union and so he's asking tintin this fictional reporter character to go in and expose the evils so that's kind of an interesting parallel life and art kind of thing going on mm -hmm. in this book right and because he felt that way after um 
that first publication as a book, and once he had complete control over Tintin um, as an entity, uh, he refused to have uh, Tintin in the land of the Soviets, uh, refused to allow it, or refused to have it published again as a book uh, until the early now, about 1973, uh, they he decided to go ahead and publish it one more time or after that because uh, there were, you know, of course there were millions of fans out there and so there were, um, you know, uh, bootleg copies of it and, and people were redrawing it and, and trying, you know, and releasing it under, you know, as, as if it was real. And so he decided to go ahead and, and publish it in 1973. It is the only, uh, Tintin not to be colorized as far as, you know, he went back for, for his earlier ones and, and redid, redid parts of it. Um, either colorized, colorized it completely. And then in instant, in examples like Tintin and, uh, the Belgian con in the Congo, he, you know, redid some of the panels to either, uh, make it more modern as far as his uh, making Tintin look like how Tintin evolved to be to look and the other characters uh, and to change some of the more politically incorrect things that he had in some of the early or in that That's one That's what's truly scary anyway. is that he actually made some changes to <laughs> Tintin in the Congo. We'll get to that later but it, I do think it's interesting yeah, so that we will. Uh, Go ahead No, I was just going to make the joke. We, we will get to the exploding rhinoceros uh, next time but uh <laughs> like early way. let's record that one tomorrow <laughs> no but you have to i mean uh, yes. obviously i mean the fact that he didn't want to go back and kind of legitimize um tintin in the land of the soviets by going back and doing the kind of revision and colorization that he did with some of the other earlier albums that had been produced in the newspaper uh is kind of interesting uh, because arguably there are just as offensive things in a lot of ways in uh, the in the Congo uh, book. Um, one thing I wanted to right. mention is that um, we we talked earlier about Erge kind of having this very quick turnaround where sometimes he didn't know what what was going to happen and then had to make very quick decisions and you can really see that in the book. But I do want to mention you know he was as you said PG a young guy. And he was put in charge of this entire newspaper. He was not just the illustrator, but he was in charge of putting out the entire edition for this kids' vert part of the newspaper. And that was a huge responsibility for him. So it was, we don't want to give the impression of uh, Hergé just being kind of this like crazy artist, like, what am I going to do? I don't care. Throw it out there. I mean, I think he was very thoughtful and cared a lot, but he had a lot on his shoulders at that time. Um, and right. as he goes forward and is able to focus more and more on just the Tintin cartoon, you can see how seriously he studies uh, other artists, other cartoonists, other cartooning um, processes, and really makes a, a very solid study and practice of creating the cartoon. So I think this early right. version is more about him figuring out his style, um, figuring out mm -hmm. different influences that were coming in, but also having this huge pressure of running kind of the entire, that entire part of the newspaper was a lot for him. Yeah. And there's um, also the fact, I mean, this was a, a Catholic mm -hmm. uh, newspaper and during the twenties and thirties, the Catholic church was dealing with um, sort of an in increased perse persecution of Christians right in different places in the world. And one of the worst places that was, was, was in the Soviet Union. Uh, there were, uh, you know, priests and nuns and monks that were being thrown in jail. There were, you know, um, believers that were being, being persecuted, being thrown in jail as well, or killed. Marx was um, very anti, anti-religion. You know, religion is the opiate of the people. He famously said so there was, actually, they were very anti-religion yes, after so. that. Yeah. So true. So, um, you know, and to his credit and to, I mean, he still, he, he stayed away from the religious side of this. Yeah. He, he was looking at it more from the, you know, the political and the economical, economic, um, uh, side of things looking like you're saying that the, the factories and how the people were treated overall, not being, not tying it to, uh, to religion, religious persecution, but more about, you know, being the haves and the have nots right. and the communists and the not and the anti-communists or the, the people that weren't, you know, towing the party right. line, so to speak. 
Um, so it was, um, you know, it was, it was still well handled by him. I think just saying, okay, I mean, he was again asked, he wanted to do his first comic album being in America because he was always fascinated with American Indians and just the, the Western culture. Uh, and he was given this, this directive to say, now we're doing, you know, going to the Soviet union and, you know, he, he took it to say, okay, we'll make it you know, still adventurous and talk about these things, but still make it a, you know, we talked about sort of the influences, one of, one of them being, you know, uh, Buster Keaton and Keystone cops and just that sort of, you know, the always moving, you know, using the medium of, 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 uh, in the case of movies, the, of motion and things, but him bringing that into the, to the comic, uh, the serialized comic was, was something that he did, did even very well at yes. this stage in his, uh, um, his artistic career. And so maybe that's what, one of the reasons there. he was so fascinated with doing car chases and escape scenes kind of over and over again, because he was working out that, you know, in that bringing in that motion influence that we hadn't, that hadn't really been seen as much before in cartoons. So, you know, working that out you kind of want to do it over and over again uh to really to really get that and interesting you know there were lots of places in there where i saw you know guys spinning down a hill gathering up snow exploding against a tree i'm like this seems really familiar like i feel like i've seen this not just in land of the soviets over and over again but it shows up then in subsequent uh, albums as well so it was very interesting to see that through line um of kind of the Tintin universe, uh, this way of, of playing around with motion. And, uh, I, that was something that was really enjoyable to me in reading this. Mm -hmm. Uh, now we can sort of break this down. Just talk about the plot. <laughs> um, the which, plot, <laughs> the, the plot, plot, which is Tintin quite... goes to Moscow and he comes back. There you yeah. go. <laughs> There you done go. Done with that section. Um, <laughs> there you go. Plot is done. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, it, I mean that is that is exactly what it is. And as far I, but as far as how he does this um, is interesting because um, or interesting to look at. Not maybe not interesting if you look at it as a as an overall story and saying, okay, how did how, how did he get to A to Z? Because there's a lot of uh, repetition and then just uh him getting in from one yep. one bad situation into a worse mm -hmm. situation and that's sort of you know that's a lot it's that's carried out throughout all of the tintin albums but this is was the, a definite example of where you can see where it's he, he was thinking about that week what do i do this week and then think about next week next week and not you know there's a few few situations and you can tell there's some forethought and and you know, over six or seven pages, which would, you know, six or eight pages, which would be a month or so of the, of the newspaper, you could see a through line and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, for the most part, it's, it's what, ha you know, how is it left at the right. end? You know, the train is about to run into the car and then, okay, what do I do now? Okay. The car is hit by the train and mir miraculously he's alive and is on the front of the train, not really realizing what happens. Um, Snowy goes from being soot covered to being clean from the rain. Woohoo! Everything yes. is great. Um, I think some, yeah. you know, even from the, Go ahead. yeah, from the, uh, in general, the plot goes, um, he's at, uh, Tintin, um, a reporter for the magazine or for the newspaper that, that Tintin Moscow. appears in, um, is asked to go to Moscow and, and do this research. And, um, Amazingly, on the train that leaving Brussels, there is a Russian agent, um, and he has he decides he's going to blow up the train and kill Tintin before he ever leaves Belgium, um, and so he he <laughs> has this you know very cartoonish bomb that he has and he lights it and says I have a couple minutes to get off the train or you know get off before it explodes and then the you know, the, in this, you know, the first few, the first few panels of this new comic, uh, you have the whole train or you know, the back part of the train exploding and Tintin and Snowy are fine. Uh, it just, <laughs> everything blows up around them. What happened to the train? And because, yes, because they're asleep, they get up and they, they, they're completely un, you know, uh, just confused about the situation and not really understanding that there was an explosion, which, you know, 
Um, we talk about one of the great things about Tintin is that it, the realism of it, even though it is, you know, a fantastical uh, overall story and, and fiction, um, you know, this was very tar- cartoonish, this, this particular version and sort of before he established what he felt was his realism and his, you know, his, um, his world, this was, you know, some of the cartoons of that day where it's, we got explosions, but I'm fine because I didn't, Clothes are a bit tattered, I'm a hero you know? and I didn't die. And so, um, you know, so it starts out with this, but then <laughs> the train arrives in, uh, Germany before going to Russia and, um, uh, you know, immediately they blame Tintin because well, obviously he would, he survived the explosion. And so it must be his fault. So they throw him in jail and he has to, um, extricate him from that situation himself from that situation. Um, end up being, getting to into the Soviet union, uh, by stealing, stealing a car and running into a train and, um, you know, there's a plane that chases them that drops bombs when they're in the car and different things. So, um, um, he immediate, they immediately, um, once in Russia, you have the, a scene where they, uh, where he is, um, comes upon a group that is, um, um, the, the factory situation right. we were talking about where you have the, the, uh, British or they, I think they're supposed to be British yeah, people British. or, uh, I don't know if there are reporters or just representatives from, from the, you know, factories from Britain and the, you know, the Bolsheviks in there saying, see how our factories uh, are at capacity and have the smoke and the, the noise from the factories. And just like Valerie said, Tintin goes up and uh, finds the, uh, finds the, the trickery going on there with the burning of hay and the beating of, of metal to make it sound like hundreds of people are working, obviously, uh, this, this noise. Uh, and then he goes and w- w- uh, witnesses an election where the, they have a, uh, we're talking about the, the, he, he based a lot of his research on one book that Valerie mentioned Moscow unveiled. and mm-hmm. there, yeah, Moscow unveiled. And part of that is, a, is, was a direct corollary to the scene in, in Tintin where they have, he describes this, communist election or a uh, town's election. And, and basically the guy in the comic says, uh, we have this communist ticket. Uh, everybody wants to vote for them, raise your hands. And then everybody does that. And then uh, the people raise their guns and they're like, is there anybody that wants to vote against any or votes wants to vote for any non-communist, you know, uh, uh, candidate? And of course, nobody raises their hands because you know everybody has their guns raised and the uh, official says, okay, the communist ticket wins, and they move on. So uh, just showing how uh, how elections are rigged. And then... Um, the last one is that, that uh, red they, line. They, that one's really interesting, too, where, you know, he kind of sees a bunch of children in um, in line waiting to get bread, and he one of them is turned away for not being communist, and he feels sorry for that child, and you know, takes, takes him a little piece of bread. So I get, I think it's snowy that shares the bread with him. And, um, yes, you know, he, so Tintin's in there saving the day also. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and then they, he, after a couple of times being arrested or being detained and escaping, he, um, learns that all of the Soviet grain has been exported outside of the Soviet Union because they are trying to show the world that communism works. So there's no food in, in the Soviet Union because all the food's been sent out. So they have a plan to go out to the uh, kulaks, which are the rich, richer peasants, as they call them, and they want to force them to give them all, or the Communist Party in the cities, all their grain. Uh, so Tintin won't stand for this. He... he um, uh, he, he becomes a, a soldier, he infiltrates the uh, army so he can go out there and warn these people. And my, probably my favorite part of the book, uh, besides the, the, the curse Deminsky, yes. which is my favorite <laughs> curse. Uh, he goes to one of these, uh, call, uh, I assume that it's called Kulaks and, 
uh, gets him to hide all of it, all of his grain by putting it in his mattress, <laughs> so that and these so are the rich. The army won't steal <laughs> these are the his rich grain. peasants. <laughs> Yes, these yes, all their grain can fit into the mattress. So yes, there are some simpli- some simplified yes. things here, like yes. the factory, how to trick people with the factory, and and this sort of thing. But again, he's he's there to try to save the day. Uh, in this case, he is captured and uh, put in front of a firing squad, and uh, he escapes by well, yes, he escapes because earlier, which I think probably what happened was, how do I get him out of this firing squad? Oh, yeah, he rode in the truck with them, and, you know, the next week he says, okay, I'll go back and say that he changed their bullets and put, you know, wads of cardboard in there. They wouldn't have noticed that, and so, yes, so he he, uh, retconned it and uh, had the firing squad fire cardboard, and he acted like he was dead, but I'm sure for a 1929 to 30 comic book, uh, comic album, or newspaper serial having him at the firing squad. And the last panel you see is all the guns firing. I'm sure that there were people there, kids especially, waiting for the next week. Yes, waiting for the next week's uh, serial to come out to see if, uh, to see if Tintin, how could Tintin survive? Um, So he goes, they steal a plane. Uh, the plane crashes, and Tintin fashions a new propeller out of wood because <laughs> he's a Boy Scout, of course. But of course, he cut it backwards, uh, so it wouldn't. Have, so he had to cut another one. There's a great little um, lesson in there about you know hard work, perseverance. You know, Tintin is still teaching those yes, good yes, you know Christian yes. values. <laughs> he, yes. He, uh, the OGPU uh, agents appear again, lock Tintin up one more time in a dungeon, but he escapes uh, because as throughout this, this first one, Snowy comes to his rescue and uh, has dressed himself up in a tiger costume, and then they have the good gag of, uh, of an actual tiger being there. And, um, you know, so you, at first for that split second, you think Tin- Snowy is put himself in a tiger costume and then you find out a couple panels later that it's actually a real tiger because Tin, because Snowy comes up in a tiger costume just you know randomly there's a tiger costume in a room when there's a tiger loose PG, this too. was a so, well known uh, aspect of Soviet Russia that there were just Russian, tigers kind of life. running around along with all these random animals just yes. kind of you know chasing <laughs> that start chasing Snowy in his half Tiger suit. Yes, yes, and yes, he, he his tiger suit rips, and all the all of the farm <laughs> animals are chasing him around, and, and that was that was a pretty funny yes. gag. And then uh, uh, he finally escapes and, and sort of drags it out of this last agent that um, um, that you know they're going to blow up all the capitals of Europe with dynamite. Woo-hoo! So that's that that's the and because Tintin found this out. This this awesome plan that the Russian agents had, uh, he was given uh, a reward and called a hero, and the comic album ends with him uh, arriving back in Brussels and uh, to a um, you know train station filled with thousands of people. Uh, calling him a hero. and um, well, I love so right there at the end how was, he's almost know. about to go back to Russia. We're about to go back in, and it's almost like Hergé says, I can't, I can't keep this up. <laughs> Just forget it. <laughs> We're going back. <laughs> Let's wrap this thing up. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> yes. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of uh, promotion that went around this. I mean, it, it became popular yep. immediately. Uh, to the people that were reading this newspaper, you know, circulation tripled, doubled, tripled, kept expanding as time went on. The the you know owner uh, of the newspaper, you know, saw the Thursday especially because of the children's section was just blowing up. So uh, they you know they did some smart things marketing wise, and and you know that not a lot of other people may have done. They they. Um, they first, well, I mean, even before they started, they, they sort of played into the idea of the fiction versus fact aspect of this, where you have, you know, they make an announcement in this 
that uh, we are eager to satisfy our readers and keep them up to date with foreign affairs. We have therefore sent Tintin, one of our top reporters, to Soviet Russia. So, I mean, they, they put these announcements in the newspaper Making it sound like you know, is it real? Is it not? You know, is that anything this. like? Uh, is that anything like getting your news from the Colbert Report or from the Daily Show? Maybe is that like a current correlation? Anyway? So I, I think yeah, this was the first example of the of Col- Colbert news. Report. That's yes. it. The Colbert <laughs> Report, and um, you know, as it started becoming popular, they did an April Fool's mm. Day publication uh, of a faked letter. Uh, confirming Tintin's existence, you know, making it look like a Russian, you know, missive from their secret police saying that, uh, you know, that this is, you should stop these publications of Tintin because it's, you know, uh, negative against the Soviet Union and uh, the Soviets will will meet, uh, or Tintin will meet his death very shortly because, you know, that, you know, of this, of this negative, uh, publicity and, and press. Um, and then they had, uh, which we mentioned last time, they had the staged event. I mean, they announced it ahead of time, you know, saying Tintin's going to return home. He's okay. And they you know, staged this event with a, an actor dressed up as Tintin and a dog. And, um, you know, they had thousands Amazing. of people show up to this train station. And, um, you know, so it was, it, it's something that they did, um, you know, a really good job on for marketing and, um, you know, made it even more popular than it, than, than it might have been just from the story itself. So, uh, so it was a good, a good time to, uh, to start this and, um, and uh, became a success because of that. Talk a little bit about the style of Hergé and um, sort of what's, what, 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 was even established in this early, you know, his first comic album, as far as things that uh, became even more evolved and, and part of his universe. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit about, about what was different about this sort of the fantastical, the, the, the hard to believe stuff that that's where we mentioned a couple things already. Um, but, you know, the first thing that, that, would definitely have to be mentioned would be his his Tintin's trademark hair, his uh, his his <laughs> uh, his windblown hair that sort of comes up in the in the front. Page eleven. Page eleven. Page is, eleven. <laughs> as Valerie shows, yes, we will throw. I that. have bookmarked it well. So that, yes. So, uh, so the idea. I, I was surprised it came up so fast. Honestly, uh-huh. that it went from you know his kind of straight that he's got like the forward comb thing going forward like this and then <laughs> the wind blows it back Whoa! like that so and yeah. then it stays so it's just within a few panels that he makes that change it's kind of incredible that you know uh, yeah, he realized he, he liked that look or something he, yeah so yeah so he did, basically a few pages in he's in a car and the wind blows his hair up into that position and pretty much stuck ever since he didn't need any sort of any sort of uh, hair products, just you know, it's there forever. Maybe he never took a shower, you know, who knows? But um, you know, he um, we mentioned before he did he did a couple things, um, a couple uh, comics or magazine type things before he did Tin Tin. One was the uh, the the Boy Scout one, the Adventures of Totor, Scout Leader of the Cockshepherds, um, and you know that that look had a very uh, similar look to Tintin. Um, you know, hair a little bit, little bit up, but definitely not as much as as, he, as it was in Tintin. It's, and they say it was uh, it was a uh, based on uh, Hergé's younger brother uh, looked a lot like him. And um, you know, he also did a uh, he was an illustrator for a a comic. Um, strip in the newspaper before Tintin. It was written by one of the uh, other people in the staff. Uh, it was called The Extraordinary Adventures of Philip Ninesse, Poussette, and Cochonet. Um, and it was two boys, one of the boys' little sister, and her inflatable rubber pig. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's what I wanted my yeah, cartoons. Thank you very much. So she, 
But he, uh, yes, after doing this, you know, drawing it for the story written by this other person, he, he definitely wanted to uh, do his own thing. And that's, that's you know, asked for permission to do this uh, and, and had recently been put in charge of the children's section of the newspaper. So he was able to do that. But um, yes, so the, the look of Tintin was um, uh, became you know, pretty much standard right up right up front. Um Although you can you can see a difference. I mean, when you look at the panels at the beginning, um, it's different than the panels at the end. I mean, it, it evolves over the course of Land of the Soviets. Um, in the beginning, his nose is a little different. The shape of the head is a little kind of misshapen. The hair is a little more funky. He's fatter. His feet are quite large. So he's he's got some kind of different looks. And then by the end, he's starting to look more like the Tintin we see in Crab with the Golden Claws and Blue Lotus mm -hmm. and, and all of that. So that's kind of interesting to kind of flip back and forth and see how he's evolving the character um, just across the course of one album in, in the way it's drawn. Yeah, the one of the things that really starts to be established even in a, a very... Uh, prominent way even more in the future books is that you know Tintin can handle himself in a fight uh you know he's he's from the beginning he's he's portrayed as a very small slight person mm. you know, more pudgy in in this than in future you know, yeah. certainly future Tintin books but um still very small compared to some of the soldiers that he's coming across you know they have the the uh the Star Wars joke, um, aren't you a little small to be a stormtrooper uh, <laughs> right. type thing where he gets into the German uniform and uh, he's, he, you know, it's Drowning way too big it, yeah. for him. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, he, he fights, you know, uh, gets in several fights against bigger people and, hand, you know, handles himself. He, he uh, Hergé draws it, you know, draws very you know, physically. <laughs> More than once he has this, this, uh, sort of Superman battering ram pose where <laughs> Tintin just sort of charges and jumps straight out into, into uh, whoever he's fighting and knocks them out with his head, I guess. Um, they do a couple things that they do uh, in some of the later books as well, where fights take place off just off the panel in a different room or something. And then Tintin will walk out or the bad guy will come out all beaten up. Um, Tintin's whistling. Or something. Yes, he'll make it. He'll make <laughs> a comment. No problem. <laughs> and he'll make make a comment about you know you're lucky I'm I'm a Boy Scout and he never said this but I'm just never paraphrasing. You're Scout, lucky yeah. I'm a nice guy because I could have done a lot worse to you if if you know for you trying to kill me, but he just sort I of beat him up and leave them. I feel like he's more aggressive actually in this book, and I feel like mm -hmm. Hergé kind of tones that back and makes him more of a righteous character going forward. Where he's not—he's not afraid of a fight. He will fight, but he's not usually the aggressor. It's usually something where the bad guys are bringing the fight to him, or Captain Haddock gets himself in a pickle, and you know Tintin has to help him out. But in this one, he actually kind of picks some fights occasionally. Sometimes as a gag, you know, when he wants, he needs to pump up the air in his tire from this car that he has is broken down during a chase scene. He, he picks a fight with this poor Russian guy, get, uh, makes him, makes the guy chase him around his <gasps> huffing and puffing. And then he puts <laughs> yes, the tire yes, to his yes. mouth and says, okay, blow this up for me. So he's very resourceful. Yes. And that state, that is a continuous characteristic characteristic he's in has a lot of ingenuity he's very resourceful but this kind of aggressive oh you know some guy's bending over i'm just going to give him a kick in the pants that part of the personality i think gets pulled back a lot maybe doesn't even exist as mm -hmm. we move forward with tintin's character development yeah and he does, he does a couple things um like that and and i i'm agreeing with you that he sort of does things here that he tones back more one of those being that he, he makes Tintin really oblivious to what he's doing or what he's done. You know, we talked, I talked about the, the train blowing up and him not really right. noticing what's going on, but you know, like, yeah. yeah. So like stealing, he steals a car from this guy at one point <laughs> and, under it. and yeah, he just lands in this car after wrecking the boat against a tree and just lands in this car and drives away. And there's a, there was a guy underneath the car that was trying to fix it. 
and then the guy, you know, lights the the, the <laughs> dripping gasoline. That's and, actually and kind of a fun one. <laughs> yeah, that was that, that was a great gag where they he lights the gasoline, and then for a couple comic strips, the gas the lit gas is chasing the car and blowing up other things as as Tintin passes, and Tintin just sort of doesn't even really notice for a while as these explosions are happening behind them and uh, finally figures it out. Um, but it's, it's, you know, sort of that side of, of him in this one being him being a little oblivious to some of the things going on around him, even in later ones, like we've said before that, that, um, snowy can see through, um, you know, sort of the, to the real person involved. Whereas, Mm -hmm. Uh, Tintin's maybe a little naive or, or just sort of takes people at their word until they prove themselves, you know, differently. Um, that, that happens a lot here. Um, I have a more, you know, um, a more obvious way. Um, some of the things again, that, that are started here or you see the beginnings of, of, of his style, one being, uh, snowy speaking his mind, uh, oh, yeah. us, us, understanding what snowy is thinking at all times uh even though nobody else can hear him um the his love of or snowy's love of alcohol um he he uh, and finds, bones and food and bones <laughs> yes yes so he finds he finds that uh finds a bottle dripping at some point and uh, drinks um we do it's see, one of the few times you see tintin drink Tintin very rarely yes. drinks and gets drunk. In fact, in later episodes, you know, uh, albums, it's Haddock who's doing the drinking, and Tintin really rejects a lot of wine, unless it's the most, you know, it would be very offensive to his host. But otherwise, he always says, no, 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 you know, just water for me. So it's very interesting to see Tintin drunk and hungover. This is kind of your mm-hmm. one opportunity to see that. <laughs> I also really love the uh, talking about Snowy and his commentary one of the things that Hergé kind of uses as a device through all the books is um, tint, uh, Snowy can get this kind of single track mindedness that becomes a running gag. And there's there's one um, series of panels where uh, Tintin says, suggests that they go get some food and Snowy starts commenting on how hungry he is and it's about time for a meal. And so, at, but of course they're thwarted in this effort to go get a meal because they meet up with some more, you know, uh, OGP, right? PU or, you know, agents or bad guys. And so, but Snowy keeps that, you know, where's the food, where's the food, where's the food going and provides kind of that comic relief in a really wonderful way amidst all the kind of action going on. So that's a, a something that Snowy continues to do throughout the album. So it was nice to see that part of his character established. Um, at such an early point. It seems like Snowy was very well thought out and kind of has a real consistency throughout the entire evolution of the different books. He's saving the day, he's running the commentary, he's seeing through the disguises. Um, so he, that's, that's Snowy. What a great, what a great little dog. <laughs> yeah, there's one, uh, there's one piece in particular that, that I did want to mention because it was, um, um, it falls into what you're talking about as far as Tintin, uh, you know, it sort of it, well, it takes place during that one track mind the one track minded mm-hmm. dog trying to find the food or the bone yeah. but um even though even so earlier in the in the comic um he he disrupts an attempt on on Tintin's life the banana peel incident yeah. banana <laughs> peel i'll just put this over here <laughs> because that because that would kill Tintin him slipping on a banana peel Um, but you know, he, Tintin, or excuse me, Snowy sees this happening and actually tricks the guy, uh, brings the banana peel back and makes the guy that set it up trip over the banana peel. So a good sight gag there. But then later on when we're talking about Tintin and them looking for food because they've been, uh, they're starving and, uh, the, the same agent dressed up as an old man is trying to, uh, trying to, you know, get in Tintin's good graces so that, you know, you assume he's going to, uh, attempt to assassinate Tintin once again. And, but Tint or Snowy has this, this, uh, one panel, which is very, very artistic where he, um, is seeing just these multiple images mm-hmm. around him. Who is of, this guy? Where have I seen before, this guy right, before? Right. Yeah. And they make mention in, in, um, 
the Tintin 10 Com- Complete Companion by Michael Farr, where he's talking about some of his artistic uh, uh, inspirations, and there's a particular artist that he uh, mentions that does things with with sort of this, you know, overlapping. Um, the overlapping images and and to, and how how you how Hergé used this to. Uh, as a representation of Snowy's uh, thought process, mm-hmm. and I thought that was really, really well done here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the other things that that you see in this that you see in future Tintin albums would be the um, representing a fight as sort of this whirling dervish yeah. of of smoke and dirt and things, Words. and all you see is like body parts sort of sticking out. You know, like an arm here yeah, and, yeah. and a leg and a foot sticking out, sort of representing the the motion turmoil of a, and chaos of a yes, the Tasmanian devil <laughs> uh, years before the Tasmanian devil, and um, uh, you see that in future ones, not quite used the same, this, exactly the same way, but still you see sort of the formation of that idea that Hergé continues on uh, using in future uh, uh, future albums. There's another great thing that I that I really loved, uh, and maybe this is coming from my dance background, but there are a few scenes of uh, snow of Tintin being really happy about things and kind of having this dance motion. Um, there's actually one on page 23 where he's really excited that he's found some parts that he needs to recreate an engine. And so he's in this amazing dance pose that, again, that exact same dance pose shows up, but instead it's Captain Haddock or Calculus um, in, in those poses. So he's forming this way of moving both action-wise, uh, expression uh, with an expression. There's another plate where uh, Tintin is trying to be nonchalant. He's got his hands in his pockets, striding forward with one foot and whistling. And we see that, you know... T- over time throughout the other albums. So he's really forming the way that his characters move and show their expression, their emotions again, through body movement, um, not just facial expressions. And I thought that was extremely advanced of Hergé to be, to be using the body in such a dynamic and communicative way of what he was trying to express in terms of the cartoon. Um, so of course that, with my dance, with my dancing, I was like, oh, Tintin's dancing, I love that. <laughs> Um, so we have the, the things that, that he did, uh, well, or that were very, you know, realistic or things that, um, that you see in future albums. And then you have sort of the, uh, the fantastical or at least the hard to believe that sort of mark this as more cartoonish and, and, you know, I mean, he's doing a comic strip, but. Uh, some of the things that that are more more cartoonish than you see in later things, um, uh, things like the which we mentioned the terrorists blowing up the train and two hundred and eighteen people in ten cars, as are mentioned later. But uh, the Tintin has uh, Tintin's fine and and because he was asleep when it happened. Um, you mentioned the man running around like so. Tintin has this car that he finds. It breaks down. He goes through and proves that he's my, as Snowy says, you're not much of a mechanic because all he's doing is pulling out parts <laughs> and throwing them behind him. And then he discovers just, uh, after, after doing all this, that it's just a flat tire. <laughs> and so, yeah, the guy comes up and, uh, you already said where he runs him around so that he can be so out of breath and sitting on the ground that all he can do, he can throw the tire around the guy's neck. So he'll blow it up. Uh, with his own breath and his, his uh, exhalations. Uh, so uh, he beats a, a Tintin beats up a bear um, who also likes alcohol. Uh, so that was, that was exciting. Um, I like it when know, he becomes the, comrade Lin, Lin Birdsky and, and can fly the plane, you know, the, cause can't all reporters fly, fly airplanes. Can't they just automatically? So he's, he's comrade Lin Birdsky, Lin Birdsky. <laughs> can't even say it correctly but <laughs> and fixes the plane while it's flying hanging from uh, the underneath wheel carriage and is able to fix the uh the fuel line i guess it is while hanging from the plane he's amazing 
He's not a good car mechanic, but he can fix a plane while he's flying it. Uh, so that's good. <laughs> he did put the engine back together you know, without even using all the parts to put them back together, and it still ran. Yeah, I guess so. he, has, he did prove himself a good mechanic, because, yes, he, he had extra parts left over from the car. <laughs> oh, well, he threw them away it because it runs fine, so I don't really need it. Um, so, yes, he beats up a bear. Um, then he, or I guess prior to this, maybe after, I can't remember... He uh, rolls down a snow-covered yeah. hill and then becomes a human snowball, uh, like you see in cartoons, of course. Um, then he falls into water. He freezes, um, and then he thaws after a soldier drags him along behind, um, you know, with a rope. So, you know, you have that going on. Snow, um, Snowy miraculously finds salt there and then douses him with salt, and that's what allows him to uh, instantly dissolve or to to uh melt because the application <laughs> of salt yes again we have the ghost that shows up the diving suit just kind of randomly in a cell uh, a dungeon cell that he can use because the dungeon is below the river so he removes the stones yes, in his I, diving I thought, suit you know, even though that even though that was a little a little weird, I thought he actually did a good setup for that because he showed you know several panels earlier that the the water level was, was here. But then oh, maybe so in the here. next week's newspaper or two weeks later, he does the gag where the water comes in and he he's in the diving suit. Because I'm glad they leave diving suits in just the jail. Yes, in case. Um, <laughs> just, just in case. Don't want those prisoners yes. to drown necessarily until we execute them. Um, he has the, uh, the gag of swimming underwater back and yep. forth. Um, basically, you know, he's, he's fooled these soldiers by having the diving suit propped up like a person and then they don't, they get help, but then they just stand at the edge of the water and don't notice that Tintin is swimming from one side to the other, getting up, throwing rocks, what? going down, swimming, getting up, throwing a rock. And uh, they think it's a ghost or they, you know, they can't figure it out. So they end up running away or being mostly knocked out. Um, I do love it how, you know, uh, most people can be knocked out and there's, you know, no real repercussions from that, you know, real life. I do it <laughs> all the time. It's it, fine. You know, yes. <laughs> but that is a, a running thing throughout all the yeah. Tintin books that, that Tintin is usually knocked out two or three times by someone with a blackjack or a bottle or something. Um, yeah, I think he would have had several concussions and some brain damage over time, but yeah. Um, oh yeah, this is a comic. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, and I do think, you know, what's interesting is that as we go forward, I do think that these kind of unusual, random, fantastical kinds of things continue to happen. Um, I just feel that because Hergé goes in and is so much more detailed and refined in his artwork and does have even more realism in the places where he wants realism. It kind of is nice to have, uh, you know, the gigantic gorilla running around the castle in the Black Island. It's kind of great when Thompson and Thompson go behind the x-ray machine and all of a sudden they're, you know, skeletons scaring each other in the middle of an investigation. I mean, he... He continues to do these very fun things that are great comic relief or just kind of a surprise, you know, having the Yeti in Tintin in Tibet. Very fantastical and a very serious uh, subject where Tintin is trying to rescue a friend who's a victim of a, of a airplane wreck. So um, I, I don't, he doesn't abandon those things completely, but he uses them more judiciously, and he uses them, I think, as an as an antidote in some ways to the realism, to the more serious subjects, drug smuggling and human traffic. I mean, he really tackles some tough issues going forward here, um, and then kind of has this, this more fun, magical, mystical, uh, imaginative side as a balance to that, and maybe to keep it in that cartoon world. So we, we will still see these crazy things happening, just in a better way, maybe. <laughs> um, there are some just flat-out factual errors that people have mm. pointed out uh, in the comic, uh, mainly just because not knowing uh, a lot about the Soviet Union, again, mostly going by newspaper stuff and that one pamphlet book that he had access to, uh, things like 
Uh, the references to bananas, which they didn't have in the Soviet Union at that time. Um, products like BP and Shell Petrol um, were not in the Soviet Union. Uh, there's some uh, British biscuits called Huntley and Palmers that were prominently shown that weren't part of the Soviet Union. Um, one of the things that he did was use a lot of uh, Russian, when he used Russian last names refer referring, he used the uh, Polish ski right. uh, instead of Olga. suffix mm -hmm. uh, right. instead of the Vich, Vich mm -hmm. which would be more of a Russian um, Russian um, ending to it to a name, family name. Um, but again, the Demnitsky was, was my favorite. So. <laughs> it's a great way. <laughs> but even, so, even so, some of these factual errors, you know, that he has, um, you know, he still took a lot of time to get things to fill. I mean, he, he made these mistakes because he was trying to fill the panels with things that people could relate yeah. to and understand, even though that, you know, it was Soviet Union, like, uh, when he was in, when Tintin was in Germany for the first part, he had signs all, all over the place with mm -hmm. German words or, or uh, German um, translated words on certain things. You know, so you could see that uh, that he was in Germany. Um, he, um, um, let's see. Even though he had, again, some of these inaccuracies, he did things well with with regards to uh, some of the vehicles and things, they uh, make mention of a Mercedes Benz convertible that he, you know, drew, uh, looked very much like the real thing and the, the uh, motorcycle with the sidecar. And so there's different things that he spent a lot of time getting right. And probably the most, uh, most talked about good things about this are his, his for such an early, album in his career uh just the sense of motion and the things that he did with um with with you know he's on a train car sidecar uh whatever the, the one where you pump the pump the levers up and down to make the the little uh train car move he he represent you know, he, he would have lines behind tin tin to sort of show that you know he's moving it up and down when he was representing wheels on cars they would be uh, you know, stretched into an oval to show motion through the through the panel, um, the the boat and different things that that in the plane, just the the you know whether it be within a panel or, or from panel to panel, some very good transitions to show motion. Uh, so there was a lot of things that people people point out within this as being uh, you know the first first uh, first stages of his craft and and you know did did a lot of things well, especially with with uh, with motion. Well, he's also using a lot of those speech bubbles. Um, and that was, you know, at that time, uh, still a fairly new development. Uh, I think it was Alain Sanogan who had started using those and he kind of was copying that and investigating it. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons that people found it so compelling is that they could see who was talking. It gave it a dynamism. Um, as the movement and the, and the action was going on to see where Snowy was talking and where Tintin was talking and the bad guys are talking and have that attributed directly to them and worked into the overall scene as opposed to just floating text like subtitles. Um, this gave, you know, dialogue always, even in a literary context, has a much more uh, rapid pace action aspect of its own. So this is why, you know, movies are all based on dialogue. And in a book, you want to have a, a novel, a fiction, you want to have a good fair amount of dialogue instead of just exposition. And so uh, because Hergé was able to uh, use these speech bubbles, I think that also contributed to this very action, present um, excitement that, that he created that so many people responded to. And that's, you know, one of the reasons that they were really, so many fans were coming on board so quickly. It just really changed everything uh, right from the get-go. Yes, you men mentioned Alain saint Ogan. Uh, was a French uh, cartoonist and did uh, the Zig and Puce uh, comic and you know, did that for, for 40, 40 some years as far as it being published. Um, and one of the things that he also pulled from that was sort of the idea of the, the animal sidekick, uh, that they have mm. uh, Sig and Puce go to, go to the, uh, Antarctic, uh, or the Arctic and, and 
wherever penguins live, and uh, they have a penguin named Alfred that joins them on their adventures, and uh, uh, he definitely uh, has said that, that that greatly influenced him to do uh, to use Snowy as this not only a a companion uh, that is you know faithful to the main character and, and helps and saves him and that sort of thing, but also the idea that um, uh, the, that this animal character can communicate with the audience uh, either directly or in this case indirectly uh, in a way that that adds to the overall uh, uh, story and the you know the the artistic stuff going on. So uh, I thought that was that was. Uh, uh, Good stuff there. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? With- yeah, I'm just... Um, <laughs> I think... Um, I think just appreciating uh, that, that so many of the characteristics of Tintin, hero of the underdog, kind of a fighter against corruption and injustice, someone who does have a lot of resourcefulness and ingenuity... All those characteristics um, are already there, and even though the comic itself, the album itself, reads as kind of a disjointed, almost sketch comedy, or kind of like really poor situation comedy, kind of, you know, has that kind of vibe, very vignette-oriented, and not with such a great storyline, those characteristics of Tintin, you can see them being born and are already so endearing. Um, So I really appreciated seeing that um in there and i think the the only other thing was just um understanding that herge was someone who took this very seriously and did study other cartoonists including walt disney um and some of the other really popular kind of serialized cartoons that were coming out of the states he would have those newspapers sent to him and would study them and really learned a lot about how to include comedy, how to include action. And then with Walt Disney, what he, what he learned was how to run a a comic and animation, um, having use, uh, working from sketches into a more developed product. So when he opened his studio, he kind of looked at the Walt Disney model. Um, one thing I did want to say is that, uh, Senogan uh, what, and, and uh, Hergé became friends, and Senogan really appreciated that Hergé was learning from him. And one thing that Hergé always said was that Tintin was for everyone, from 7 to 77. And during the course of their friendship, Senogan uh, became, he turned 77, and he famously contacted Hergé and said, do you mind if we change, can I get permission to continue reading Tintin? Because I'm no longer going to be 77, I'm going to be 78. And so uh, they changed it now that you could read it up until you're 88 years old. So <laughs> that was a kind of a really fun part that shows the um, how, how beloved this was by not only readers, but by uh, Hergé's colleagues as well, that they really appreciated this, this fine artwork um, that, that Hergé produced. Very good. Um, yeah, again, this is, you know, his first foray, his first attempt uh, was a commercial uh, success. Uh, you see the beginnings of what become uh, the, the, the beloved uh you know, attributes of, of this, of this, uh, of the story and the characters and the design and this world. Uh, so we're very happy that, uh, that it, that it exists for us to see now. Um, easy to, easy to find. And if you do, uh, while we don't recommend it for, uh, certainly being to be your first read, uh, if you find that you enjoy, uh, the world of Tintin that um, that going back and reading this after that is is definitely a positive thing to do. You get to see these uh, how it all started and and where we where we uh, where we get to in the future. So uh, um, we hope you enjoy our talk enjoyed our talk about uh, Tintin in the land of the Soviets. Uh, next time we will be uh, tackling the second. Uh, comic album, which was started right after this one ended, uh, called Tintin in the Congo. And um, we will record this in probably two or three weeks. I uh, don't have the date, but we'll uh, 
uh, we'll post that. So if you have any questions about this, uh, Tintin and the Soviets, or about our, our next topic, uh, again, you can contact us uh, through uh, specficmedia.com. You can go to the post there and ask your questions. Uh, we have a voicemail line which will appear at the bottom of the screen because I did not uh, bring the number. <laughs> it's 704-981-1SFM, which I think is 1736, but if I'm wrong, the number will be down here and you'll be able to, to see what it actually is. You can also write us emails at tintin at specficmedia.com. Um, and you can leave comments on YouTube where this will show up uh, first after we get it edited. Um other than that, uh, again, we hope you enjoy this and come back next time for, uh, for our next uh, show, uh, which will be Tintin in the Congo. Um, oh, I did have one last thing to say. We had one comment um, that I did want to throw out for, for you, Valerie, in case we get to this point. Okay. No, uh, I, a friend who has followed me ever since I, you know, wrote my novel and, and has been a fan. He 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 lives in Germany, um, or possibly Denmark. Um, his email address is Denmark, but he mentioned he said that if we ever want to talk about different languages, uh, because you had mentioned, you know, your family oh, yeah. members, he he has the German versions, or at least has access to them. And we can talk about any you know differences Very between cool. the different uh, different languages. Uh, so, Silvanor, uh, thank you for 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 that uh, email and comment, and uh, we may take you up on that in the future. So, uh, um, again, anybody can leave comments if it's made before we record our next one, uh, which will probably be at least a week or two after this comes out. Uh, we will try to include those in in that next episode and. Um, any parting thoughts, Valerie? No, just read Tintin. Have have buttered toast and yes, you're gonna go and drink your hot chocolate and have your <laughs> buttered toast. I, I, That's right. I, 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 you, next time, I expect to actually see some buttered toast and, and hot chocolate. I was too wiped out from the from the sleepover. <laughs> uh, Even toast was too hard. Oh gosh! <laughs> but um, yes, the Irish butter and the. Um, yeah, I thought your 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 yes. Irish coffee somehow was getting in that there. That would be good so too. We could do that. That'd but, be good uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> Very Irish. So thanks everybody for for joining us tonight, and um, we'll see you next time on Tintin Forever. Bye everybody. Forever.